Good afternoon. Hi. Welcome to Carpenter Hall and the Festival Noon series. Also welcome to those of us joining us on HowlRound. Hi. My name is Trisha Patrick, and on behalf of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I thank you for your attendance. Brochures about the Festival Noon series are in the front of Carpenter Hall and highlight upcoming Festival Noon events. Please allow me to share a couple of the events coming up in the next couple of days. On Wednesday, June 29th, we will have a demonstration, Learn the Dance, the Wiz Choreography. Mm -hmm, that should be a lot of fun. On Thursday, June 30th, we have a Preface Plus for Row. On Friday, July 1st, we have a conversation, Fantasy, Magic, and Folklore, The River Bride, and the Art of Storytelling, with members of the River Bride cast, and moderated by yours truly. We can see each other again. <laughs> Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> So tickets for these events and more can be purchased at our box office. Uh, please take a moment right now to silence your cell phones and we ask that you take no photos. We have our wonderful staff photographer, Jenny Graham, here to take photos for you all on your behalf. <laughs> Thank you so much. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Peter Segel and Queen Kui Gwen. Give a round of applause. So Peter Sigel is the author of numerous plays that have been performed in large and small theaters around the country and abroad, including Long Wharf Theater, Actors Theater of Louisville, Seattle Repertory, and Florida Stage. He also has written a number of screenplays, including Savage and Cuba Mine, an original screenplay that became, without his knowledge, the basis for Dirty Dancing Havana Nights. <laughs> Among Segal's honors in theater are a Drama Log Award for Directing, grants from the Jerome and McKnight Foundations, and a residency grant at the Carmargo Foundation in Cassis, France. Yes, he has been commissioned to write new plays for the Seattle Repertory Theater and the Wind Dancer Theater, and has been invited to work on his plays at Sundance, the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, and New Harmony Project. In 1997, Peter joined the panel of a news quiz show on NPR. Yay. Yes. Co-produced by WBEZ Chicago that made its deb debut on air in January 1998. In May of that year, he moved to Chicago to become the host of the show. Since then, wait, wait, no. don't tell me, <laughs> has become one of the most popular shows on public radio, heard by nearly 3 million listeners on 520 public radio stations nationwide. Yeah. And heard by a million people every month via podcast. So that is our lovely Peter. And now, Kui Gwen is a playwright, screenwriter, and co-artistic director of the Obie Award-winning Vampire Cowboys. That's right. Even the name deserves an award. His scripts include the critically acclaimed Vampire Cowboys productions of The Inexplicable Rep Redemption of Agent G, Soul Samurai, Alice in Slasherland, Fight Girl Battle World, Men of Steel, Living Dead in Denmark, <laughs> Stained Glass, Ugly, A Beginner's Guide to Deicide, and Vampire Cowboy Trilogy. <laughs> Other scripts include She Kills Monsters, Bike Wreck, Aliens vs. Cheerleaders, Trial by Water, and Crunk Fu Battle Battle. <laughs> Additionally, Kui is an award-winning fight director who has worked extensively as an instructor and choreographer for such places as Columbia University, Lab Rent Theater, Mayi Theater, Long Wharf Ensemble Studio Theater, The Public, Here Arts Center, and many others. Recent honors include the 2000, in 2016 Harold and Mimi Steinberg ATCA Award, a Sundance Institute Fellowship, 2013 AATE Distinguished Play Award and Best 10 Plays of 2013 by Time Out Chicago, 
2012 and 2009 GLAAD Award nominations, uh, 2012 ITBA Patrick Lee Award, and 2010 IBA Award nomination, and TCG Young Leader of Color. Kui is a proud member of New Dramatist, Mayi Writers Lab, Ensemble Studio Theater, the Playwright Center, and an advanced actor combatant with the Society of American Fight Directors. For television, he has written for Peg and Cat, airing on PBS Kids. They are here today to have a conversation. Two playwrights talk Viet Gone. Please join me in welcoming Peter Segel and Kui Gwen. Hi. Guess which one I am. Uh, we, had a, we had a wonderful talk planned for you today, but sadly we spent all our time listening to our resumes. So, <laughs> thanks for being here. <laughs> We're out of time. And I think Queen and I just bonded over the hellish experience. <laughs> Of standing waiting for it was, your. It was down to like specific yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. I, I, did, I, did, I didn't know that was your blood type. I was really excited <laughs> right. to find that out. That was great. My coloring award from kindergarten. Yeah. Was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> my problem is all of my theater credits. Thank you for looking them up. Um, <laughs> are 20 years old. So I was like listening, going, Yeah, I used to be something. What happened to me? <laughs> So anyway, hello. Kui and I just met uh, a little while ago before this uh, started, and it turns out we have something uh, very important in common, which is neither of us have seen this production of Viet Gone. Um, that's true, that's true. I, I hear it's good. Is it good? Have you guys seen it? You like it? Um, because we both got in last night and, and we just uh, missed it completely. Yeah, we just missed it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. uh, so it's going, we're going to be talking about a production that neither of us have seen, and I, I assume. Well, Kui, I know a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah, Kui has. <laughs> just. Kui at least has seen it before, but I've, yeah. I've only been able to read it, so that's what you're in for is just. Just, just ignorance. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 the idea is that. We were going to talk about the play, and, and maybe if we have time at the end, uh, take some questions from those of you who have seen it, and that would, maybe you can describe it to us, because that would be <laughs> or really interesting. Or act it out. That would be amazing. So uh, let's start here. Um, when I was writing plays, everything I wrote usually started with one little thing that got stuck in my mind, like mm. the you know, grain of sand that became a pearl. So uh, what was it that started you off on this play? Uh, uh, money. Like someone, uh, South Coast rep. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's a kind of a joke, but kind of no. no, no, no. Like it's a, they they commissioned me to write a play for them, and uh, I didn't know what I wanted to write about. They were, it was very open ended. They're like, you can write anything you want. I was like, well, I'm a geek. I'll write about comic books, and that's what yeah. it's going to be. It was going because it was set in uh, in Orange County. It's right close to Comic Con. I'm kind of known for writing geeky things. And, uh, but part of the commission was you're going to go around the community of Orange County and meet folks there uh, and just see what, you know, if there's anything that would inspire you. I'm like, that, I'm totally open because I literally don't have any idea what I'm going to write about. And so I, they, they, they sent me around uh, to, to meet people of the community of Orange County. And what I didn't realize was Orange County was, has the largest population of, Asian Amer of Vietnamese Americans uh, in America. And so yeah, there's a neighborhood they even call Little Saigon. Yeah, Little Saigon over there. And so I was meeting all those folks, and they brought me to uh, UCI, uh, you know, uh, Irvine, whatever. UC Irvine. It, UC Irvine. Where the artistic director of this theater used to teach. Yeah, and so they have a they have like a archive of just photos from all the refugee camps yeah. across America. And so they were trying to tell me all about you know Orange County, but I just got obsessed with looking at these photos because one of the photo kind of like files was photos from Fort Chaffee, where my parents had. You know, you know, where the place at, where they'd come into America, and that's I had never seen photos from it. And so, like, you know, as they blabbered on about Orange County, I just kind of went through and just was obsessed with trying to find a photo of my mom or my dad. I didn't, but but that was what was stuck in my head. And then I was like, well, I guess I'm not gonna write about geeks after all. I'm gonna write about my parents. So wait a minute. So you had this sort of long. You went to Orange County. You're talking to other people you don't know. Yeah. Because uh, South Coast like, oh, maybe you'll find something to write about it here. And what it brought you back to was your experience of your own parents. Yeah. Right. In Arkansas. And, mm -hmm. yeah. when, and had you, prior to that, 
written anything or thought of writing anything about your parents' experience, about the Vietnamese American experience, anything like that? Uh, yeah, the, the very first play I ever wrote was this play called Trial by Water. It was the first play that was ever produced professionally by my theater company in New York. It was my first like, you know, professional gig. Uh, and it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the sheer opposite of what VidCon is. Right. It was very reverential. It was, I was trying to make Vietnamese people look and feel like Vietnam, Vietnamese people. Uh, what does that mean? It, it, it was it, in no way was it. It was it was like I was trying to basically imitate like what I was assuming David Henry Wong would do, right? Or like some other writer would do to approach a very serious subject matter. They were uh, noble. They were noble. Terrible. Yeah, and I and I was I was twenty two at the time. I had never written anything in my life. It was literally my first play, and so it got produced. And then my parents saw it. And I thought this was amazing because people were there and they were clapping. And my mom looked at me and was like, "This does not sound like you." <laughs> And, uh, and my response was like, F you, mom, you don't know how I sound. It's like, no, 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 like, you haven't read anything I've ever written. She's like, no, 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 not like, like, what, how, like what you write. I don't know what that sounds like. But like you, you don't talk like that. And that kind of stuck in my head. And that was... So you were, and, and this is, I think, for those of you who have seen the play, extremely relevant. Yeah. How these characters talk. Absolutely. So you were, at that time, 22 years old, you're writing a play about Vietnamese people uh, in America, I assume. Yep. And and they were and they were talking in that kind of, I mean, I don't, it, I won't, I won't say stereotypical way, but a way that like I'm used to seeing Asian characters. Absolutely. And there's there's a sense of dignity to them, a sense mm -hmm. of nobility. Like every Asian character sort of always. They're all like, like Spock. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Totally. Okay. There. Yeah. yeah Just go there. They're, they're all like Spock. Yeah. That's what. Like, there's a lot of reverence for yeah. a lot of reverence yeah, for like parents. Really logical. They're yeah. robots. Absolutely. Issues like, issues of honor yeah. come into yeah. play. Yeah. And, yeah. and shame. so that's what I basically did. Yeah. My mom hated it, and then I. It was literally that was the thing that transitioned me into creating vampire cowboys. I was like, fine. You don't want me to sound like that? Then I'm never going to write anything like that. And I started to write the most obnoxious, vulgar, kind of in-your-face theater, period. Like, right. it was like, it, was, it had superheroes and comic books and fights and martial arts and hip-hop and lots of vulgarity. And Because um, that, that sounds like you. That, that's that sounds you. like that's that is who I am. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know, and so I was like, that's going to be the thing. And I did that for, like, almost 15 years. Right. And then when this came around, and I knew I was going to write about my parents, the one thing I knew that I was going to do was I was going to make sure that I wasn't going to make that mistake ever again. Right. This play was going to sound like me. It was right. not, even if it didn't make sense and it might offend people, I was going to make it sound like me because when my mom and dad see it, they might go, I can't believe you put our sex lives on stage. But that does sound like you. Right. So I wanted to make sure that was good. I'm going to skip ahead and say, have your parents seen this play? No. No? <laughs> They keep saying they and will, this is, this is but then they find out what it's about, and they're like, mm, maybe. Really? Yeah. So this is, and this is yeah. production number number two, two. Yeah, yeah. and more are coming. This production is going to Seattle, and they're going to do it at Manhattan Theater Club. Where do your parents live? They live in El Dorado, Arkansas. So. Oh, are they still there? They're still there. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Okay. And how are you <laughs> anticipating that day well, when your parents show up? Uh, well, I'm not going to sit by them, because I'm, gonna, I'm afraid they'll kill me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I hope they like it. I mean, they've read a lot about it because it's, it's made it into the Vietnamese press, which ironically is the thing that made my parents finally think of me as a real writer. When you got written up in the Vietnamese yeah, like, press? Not, not the New York Times, like the Vietnamese press. Oh, yeah. They're like, oh, now you're a real writer. I'm like, I, I just oh, wa I just want to. I just want to put out here that as a Jew from New Jersey, my parents cared about the New York Times. That's, <laughs> that's, that, was, that was a big day for me. When, yeah. when, when the New York Times referred to me as a... Peter Sagal, a playwright, they were like, oh, there you go. Anyway, but be that as it may. So uh, I lost my, so let's talk about the language of the play. So uh, the play opens, playwright character comes on stage, what? which I have to say, speaking as a guy who's seen a lot of bad theater in my time, that is like warning sign number like four on the list. Oh, yeah. Right? You know? When, oh, yeah. yeah. The, the, the only thing worse than a playwright coming saying, hello, I'm the playwright, is that as a character comes on stage, it says narrator. Uh, or, I, yeah. I'm going to do that next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's bad. That's kind, of, that's kind of like my thing. So, so <laughs> the play opens with a character playing you, right. identifies himself as you, comes out and says, this is what we're going to do. Um, this is a play about people who are not my parents, and this is how they're going to talk. Yeah. And when did you add that scene? I added that scene uh, very, very late in the process. Yeah. Uh, at, at some point, the lit manager... At uh, at South Coast Rep, yeah. uh, was worried 
that starting the, the play with yellow motherfucker on a motorcycle yeah. might offend people. L l let's... <laughs> So she's like, maybe you warn them a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let, let, let me establish this. Uh, so we have people who haven't seen the play yet, right? Is that true? Okay. So in the play, give me an example if you can. You don't have to quote it. Just give the sense of it, of how the Vietnamese characters, and presumably they're, they're in America mostly, but they are speaking Vietnamese to each other. Give me a sense of how they sound. They sound like me right now. Yeah, just like uh, dropping F-bombs. Yeah, well, MF right now I'm trying to stay somewhat clean. But yeah, they don't, though. Yeah, they don't, not at all. Yeah, so in the yeah. course of the play, they speak really idiomatic modern English. Absolutely. And they swear an awful lot. And they and I, I'm not going to swear today because it's too early in the day to hear me swear because it will blow your minds if you hear my <laughs> voice say fuck. Um, the... Oh. <laughs> So, and, and I, it's not only that, so let's establish that. So, that, so they're talking very enigmatic modern English, the kind of thing you, not, you might hear a 20-year-old or 30-year-old person, American, speak today. Yep. Um, and the Americans' characters who show up, how do they sound? Uh, they say things like, cheeseburger, hamburger, waffle fries. And that's a sentence. That's right. Like, that's, how, that's, that's them saying something like, oh, nice to meet you. And, and were you trying to sort of say, this is how Americans sounded my parents with their limited English? Absolutely. That was what yeah, it was, as totally opposed true. to like, I'm going to turn this goddamn stereotype on its head. Yeah, well, I, well, I was like, I didn't know what a broken English sound would be. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to write random English words yeah. that were specifically like American things that my parents were like, what is that? Right. Huh? And, NASCAR? Yeah. and so that's, that's, that's the aesthetic of the play. That's that what is, happened. Yeah. There's a lot of other things in the play, including martial arts. We'll get there. But, but at one point then, somebody working in the play with you said, oh man, you better explain this. Because yeah. if people come in and they see actors purporting to be 30-year-old Vietnamese people recently exiled to America talking this way, they're going to be freaking out. They well, it was more so the, the fact that the play kept changing the rules as we went. Like, it right. broke time. It, like, suddenly would change style. Uh, and so her thing, because she knew that, in, like, my, the, the New York audience knows me very well, so I'd never have to do that shorthand. Yeah. So she was like, you just need to have a scene that establishes that the, that you, the playwright, control this world in yeah. a very, like, Willy Wonka way. Yeah. And so that was the purpose of writing that. To just go, oh, well, here's the play. This guy that's obviously not me yeah. is going to say, I'm me. Yeah. And then just do whatever I want. This, this, is a, this is a playwright question. Did you resist that idea? Were you like, no, they need to figure it out, man. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And how do you feel about it now that that's part of the text? Uh, I think it's funny because the people do it really funny. And, yeah. so, and I'm a whore for laughs. So yeah, like, well, we all you know, are. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're laughing. This yeah. is amazing. Okay, <laughs> let's keep it. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I, I don't know though. what you're talking about when it comes to <laughs> <Yeah>. that. I, <laughs> As I'm sure you all know, I've never debased myself for a laugh. <laughs> all right, so that's the language of the play. Mm -hmm. um, was your intent something along the lines of, if you could speak idiomatic Vietnamese at this time, that's what they would have sounded like, or were you doing a more Hamilton-like thing, uh, which I believe the phrase is the, 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 the story of then told by the people in language of now, i.e., are you trying to describe how they actually spoke, your parents or the people around mm -hmm. them? Or was it more of a fantasy of how they might speak if they existed today? Well, it's, I mean, it, it goes a little deeper than yeah. just, just, I guess that, that just, yeah. like, oh, I want the, 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 an impulse. Uh, it's mainly because uh, the, the, the heartbeat of why I made it sound the way it sounded was the fact that I, as an Asian American kid growing up, never saw anything that made me feel good. When it ha when it came to seeing stuff that was about Asian America, like, what do you mean? What, how did it make you feel? Well, like seeing like the noble Asian made me feel nerdy. You know, it made me feel like the other. It made me feel exotic. Made yeah. me feel out there. And and so when I wrote the play, it was though I'm very excited that everybody seems to like it. Like I was literally writing it specifically for the teenager me. Like the teenager me who was going to be sitting in that audience who was longing to see a badass Asian American character because you don't get to see that on TV. You don't get to see that in movies. Like that gets white, whitewashed right out, right? Yeah. And so I wanted to see that. And so I was like, well, then I'm going to make them, I'm going to take away anything that makes it feel exotic. I'm going to make it feel like now, the music that you like now, I'm going to make it sound like the stuff that I would have been drawn to. Right. Uh, and also, like there's the, 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 you know, all the swearing and all that, I understand it may offend some. But for me, when you're like 13, 14, 15, 
uh, you're looking for something that's cool, right? right? Like you're looking for something like that's part of it. Yeah, you get you can get like uh, the the like the very smart yo-yo ma's out there like oh, I want to be a violinist one day, but like you also need, I think, what, regardless of what your race is, like if you're black, right. you 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 want strong African American characters that, right. that that make you feel strong. Whether it's Jay Z, whether it's Denzel, like. Here, I needed to give that to a group of kids that I didn't think that 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 look was out there. And so when when those characters came out there, I just wanted them to feel cool. Well, I, I, I can totally that. dig that. But there's this whole other element. You're writing about your parents. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a kind of overwhelmingly psychological. Super creepy. Yeah. Totally. It's super creepy. Yeah. You're writing about your parents. You're, not only you're writing about your parents' romance, you're writing about their sex lives. Yeah. No, I don't like talking about that. Um. Try <laughs> to. <laughs> And, and, Whistle and, by that grave. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And what I mean is, so, so like, all right, when you are writing, <laughs> yeah. let's just let's just say it, when you are about when you are writing about your mother having casual sex, yeah. which she does a fair amount in the play, yeah. are you engaging in a kind of like again this sort of fantasy that you were talking about? What if my mother at that time was a, a, a sexually independent, confident person who did this sort of shit, or? Are you actually trying to describe how she really was at that time? I, I, I want my answer to be A, yeah. that this was not real. Yeah. But unfortunately for me, yeah. it was B. Because uh, part of my interview process with my, my parents was they didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. Honestly, they, did, they gave no, like they did not want me to write about them. Uh, you know, I, I probably, I've said this, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, you know, like when you're, interviewing people from like a traumatic kind of like experience yeah. they kind of don't want to talk about it. like it's like the same problem yeah. when people try to interview holocaust survivors right. or, 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 or or Syrian refugees or something likewise Vietnamese don't want to talk about the hardship of the fall of Saigon right and so I kind of lied to them I just totally tricked them out I was like okay I'm just doing a general play about Vietnam not about you no um, <laughs> But I need to fact check some stuff, right? Even though they know that the internet exists, but I pretend like yeah. I didn't. And so I was like, oh, so the Vietnam War was like a war between Vietnam and China? And they're like, no, why are you so stupid? And because like <laughs> the biggest fear that any Vietnamese parent or any Asian parent has is having a dumb child. And so, <laughs> and so that kind of opened them up to talk more. But then, specifically, at some point, I kind of eased that, the, the speci specificity about yeah. Vietnam to them. And at some point, they started to talk about their sex lives. Like, because my, the, 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 the story that I grew up with about how they met and fell in love was, we met in this refugee camp. Right. It was love at first sight, and we were together forever. And then now, at, like, you know, in my mid-30s, asking about this conversation, like, oh, you're not dumb. We just had sex. And really? Like, what? <laughs> and they... And that creeped me out, and they were so tickled by how creeped out I was. <laughs> Just like how you like to mess with your own kid. They're yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. now we're going to mess with you. We're going to tell you all of it. And so it was like, so they just kind of told me stuff I never wanted to know. I was like, I don't want to tell this story. What happened to the love at first sight? I was going to write like, you know, when Harry met Sally, but with Asian people. They're like, no, sorry. You're writing a sex comedy now. Really? And so, but they, again, didn't know I was going to write a play about it. Uh, and then at some point they did. And then suddenly they tried to retcon and retroactively go, Oh, that was lies. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, so, so I'm going to tell you a story. So uh, one of my close colleagues and friends is, a, is a, similar to you. She's about 30 years old. Parents Vietnamese, born in Vietnam, immigrants. And uh, they're very conservative people. They're, you know, she had to get married, even though she's not religious, in a Vietnamese Catholic church in Sacramento, where she's from. And I said, so I'm like, I'm reading this play. I'm talking to the playwright. And it's like amazing, because in this play, his parents, who were your parents' generation, like, have casual sex and talk about it with their own mother. And she looked at me like, no goddamn way. <laughs> so, so, like, do you think that your parents were exceptional or different or that her parents have been lying to her? I don't know. Uh, I, again, I would like to think that my parents are just weird. Um, but I don't know. I actually, I have no idea. I mean, like, my parents' words for me was about the refugee camp experience yeah. in general were... Uh, to kind of to go, don't judge us, but like we had lost everything. Like my mom, my dad had lost his wife and his two kids. Yeah. My, my mom lost her fiance, and so 
they were like any human beings. They were looking for connections, something that would comfort them. And there's nothing more comforting than the human touch. Right. And so that's their. That's like, she's like, well, you know, like we didn't talk about it because yeah. we are from a con more conservative community, but it it was part of like it's it's all human. It's like it's not like you know. So so that it's so uh, I don't I, know. I have but, never seen, and this is just maybe my sheltered existence. I have never seen a play about Asian characters, i.e. In, from Asia, i.e. not immigrant kids, second, third generation, having casual sex. It just doesn't come up in like that. Remember we were talking yeah, yeah, about yeah, that, that image of Asian people that you were writing in your first play. Yeah. They don't do that. No. You know, there's even, you almost like parody that with that scene with, I'm going to say, her, your mother, yeah. Tron, right? No? Yeah. yeah. Tong. Yeah, yeah. Tong. With her uh, fiancé back in Vietnam. Yeah. Where he's like, oh, I love you so much. And he's speaking in this very typical flowery language. Yeah. And she's like, you just want to do it. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, were you like going to write it? Were you intending to write about sex in the context of Asian characters in a way that we haven't seen before? No. Like, I don't, I don't think that it was a conscious effort. It was, ba I mean, like, without a doubt, the, the syntax was definitely modern. Like, right. I don't think my mom was as cold yeah. or as... Because she's pretty cold. Yeah, she's pretty cold. Yeah. Right? Like, but, but, it, but I did want to like hit the experiences that they went through like right. that was a like there was a proposal at a hotel room that she was trying to avoid because she didn't really dig them but my grandmother was like he offers like like he, he's stable and she didn't want that and then when like my mom met my dad my grandma was like you don't want him right. you know and yeah so so it, it was so, so all those events were real it's just like the way that it was you know they're, they're very modern yeah without right. a doubt they're acting like me because i didn't really do any research to how vietnamese in 1975 acted okay i want to ask a little bit more about your parents and then move on to some other topics uh and this is i'm going to try to avoid spoilers but at the end of the play <laughs> your uh <laughs> everybody dies <laughs> No, I'm sorry. That's Hamlet. Um, at the end of the play, your father appears again. He's been throughout the play, yeah. but and, and because I haven't seen the production, I don't know this. It's the same actor who yeah. appears, the same actor, and but he's transformed into what you might call a more realistic version. Yeah. I.e., instead of speaking idiomatic English, he's speaking accented English. That's more. And is that character we see? Is that like recognizably your father? If your father walked in after seeing the play, like, oh yeah, that guy. I saw yeah, him. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so two questions, and this is where I want to avoid a spoiler. He has a monologue in the last scene, yeah. uh, which is about his experience and his feelings about the Vietnam War. Uh, so two questions. Why did you want to present for what we'll call like the real father versus the imagined father at the end of the play? Why did you think that was necessary? And that's also the reintroduction of the playwright character, who thank God we don't see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And why did you save what struck me as a really important central speech about many of the things that happened in the play until the very end? Uh, well, I think there's a couple, couple, couple reasons. One, uh, the number one reason why it ended up being there uh, was because when I did my first draft of the play, yeah. it was really short, and this was another play I had written, yeah. and so I just glued it on. Right. <laughs> so that was the number this one This happens to more make it than longer. you think, by the way. <laughs> You're sitting there going, shit, this is short. I've got to tag something on here. I know. Yeah. yeah. So that so that's yeah. what happened. But then as I kept writing the play, it, that 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 last thing that was which I intended to cut the whole time. Yeah. Uh, just started to make more and more sense to the whole play. Really. Like it was like, oh, I kind of get how this all this gets to this. Yeah. That you get to see my kind of like comic book version of the 1975, yeah. and then land in something that felt yeah. very, very real it, and poignant. Because even on the page, I thought it was really powerful because. As you just said, you, you'd had this comic book version, this f very fluorescent version, almost, well, let's, let's say, not very realistic version, yeah. with hip-hop and fights and sort of cinematic stuff, and then all of a sudden you have this guy at a table saying, this is what happened, and this is mm -hmm. what it was like, and this is how I feel about it. And, it was, and even though that's the end of the play, it was really quite powerful. It's like, oh, it made us, it, I'm guessing that it makes you sort of all of a sudden think about everything you've just seen in a totally different way, which is cool. Um, but I don't want to say any more about that because that's the end of the play. Um, <laughs> how about time in the play? It shifts back and forth. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, though, is, is that 
for the most part, it shifts back and forth within the present, which is weird. I mean, obviously, it's one thing to have a scene in the present, then go to far past, and then come back to the present to proceed. But you skip around the present. When we, the first scene is they're riding on this motorcycle. They say, oh, yeah, I don't need about that girl. And then you go back just, just a month. Yep. So what's that about? Why not just tell well, the story at least at the Fort, is it Fort Benning? Fort Chaffee. Fort, Fort Chaffee. Chaffee. Fort Chaffee. Yeah. Why not just tell at least that story? Well, I just thought it would be really weird to go all that and then just have like another play where they were just on a motorcycle and yeah. then, then have that tacked on. So I was like, oh, well, I have to tell both my dad's journey yeah. to how he, like part of that motorcycle journey is how he got back to my mom. Right. And so I needed to tell that, but I didn't know how to tell it like in his own chunk. Right. So I just decided to like sprinkle it across the whole right. thing. And so that, you keep I, going back to the motorcycle. Yeah, I just keep going back to the motorcycle. Did that motorcycle trip really happen? Did they really ride from Arkansas to Sacramento? Or yeah, well, it, it's, it's interesting because like at first I thought this was a unique story. Right. But when we, we did a reading of it in Orange County and when I was, uh, you know, when they heard it, they, were, they had brought out like a whole bunch of Vietnamese people from all different ages and yeah. a lot of people that were my parents' age and a lot of the Vietnamese people, including one gentleman in particular, were like, that's not uncommon, and that's exactly how I met my wife. Well, and what's also, not uncommon? Motorcycle trips? That motorcycle trip to go to, to, to if you were in Fort Chaffee, getting to, Fort, uh, to Camp Pendleton to get on that, that plane to go to, back to Guam, because that was the thing. Like, for a moment in time, anyone who escaped Vietnam, Vietnam said, anyone who wants to come back, we will let you come back. So the, 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 the triumphant government communist government of like, we'll now unified you, Vietnam said, you can come back, You can everybody. come back, but here's your time to do it. And so people were trying to do that. Some people were like, I don't know how to live here. And so they were trying to do that, and then most of them didn't go. My dad didn't go back. And there was one gentleman during that reading was like, oh, not only did I do that trip, I met your father. I know your father. Really? Yeah. And so I was like, wait, hold, hold up. Who are you? And then he gave me like his rank, what squadron he was in, all that. And I called up my dad. I was like, dad, do you know me? He's like, oh yeah, let me talk to him. And so it was like, it's like, oh, well, I guess I wrote this correctly enough yeah. that people recognize my dad. Did, you did your father, by the way, really go two up on a motorcycle from Arkansas to um, Oceanside, no, California? No, no, that's all. That that's exaggerated. Because I, I didn't want to put like five motorcycles on on screen, um, on stage. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, he did. He he didn't go because I I no, no, motorcycle it, and actually, I'm like no way. There, there's more people. There was there was him. There was the character Neon. There was also another. There was a nephew that isn't in the play at all. That, that went with them, that he had reconnected in the right. refugee camp. There was, there was a group of them. A group of them. Yeah, but like in this, it made it, I made it just one, because it made it easy. I understand. Yeah. Um, let me talk a little bit about, uh, about your general aesthetic. Uh, you talked about the fact that you're like a comic book guy, and you like fights, and you like manga, and you like hip hop, mm -hmm. and you stick that in your plays, right? Yep. So there's a, and you're a fight choreographer. Yep. Right. So, uh, have you always like had lots of physical action in your plays? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was, I, I mean, I, I started off as a martial artist when I was a little kid. Yeah. And so that was something that was always part of my life. Yeah. And uh, when I started writing plays, uh, I I didn't. It was I'm, honestly the reason why I put fights in my plays. It's the only way that I know how to communicate with my actors. I always I always felt jealous that directors got to talk to actors all the time. Yeah. And I didn't. And so I was like, well, then I'm going to get a reason why I get to talk to them and become friends with them as well. Oh, I see. And you were so, like trying to like actually find an excuse to talk to the actors. That was it. And if you wrote in a fight scene, and since you're a fight guy, you get to go in and talk to the actors. Yeah, and I could have my own relationship with the actors. Because I always, always hated that little gap between me, the director, and the performer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I wanted something that was a little bit more direct. I think, yeah. you know, so they felt comfortable enough to go to me. It's like, oh, this fight looks weird, but also these lines seem weird. It's yeah. like it's still, that collaboration felt more natural and organic. I, so you're how old? I am 39. 30, 39. And you started writing plays when you were 22? Yep. Okay. So you, you grew up in Arkansas? That is correct. Okay. How does somebody of your age, you're not quite, you're a little old for a millennial, but still, how does somebody your age who grew up, as you say, on comic books, and I'm assuming martial arts and martial arts movies, how did you happen in the theater? I thought the theater was for old people like me. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I love this. I mean, I, I love this theater because it's still, uh, it, it's, it's the, it's the, it, it, it's the most, to me, the most punk rock thing I can do. Like, I write TV, I write film, I do that, but there's so many elements of getting approval from other people. Yeah. But I wrote this thing. Do you approve it? Okay. And then don't give me notes. I have to address it because they're giving me money, right? But in theater, because I had my own theater company, it was the opportunity like, this is what I want to do, and nobody can tell me no. Right. 
and that allowed me to create the aesthetic that I have. Because I think if I didn't, if I didn't do that, I, th I think it would have taken me a long time. Like we were just talking about Annie Baker, right. like how she just kind of came out the womb and she had her voice. She knew what she wanted to do as an artist, and it just keeps growing and evolving. But it was always ever present. I wasn't. I, I don't feel that lucky as a writer. I felt did, like I needed you, that time. Did you see plays? I mean, because I grew up going to Broadway in like the '70s and saw plays, mm -hmm. which were very, shall we say, th um, I mean, it's about to say theatrical, but in a weird way, what I mean is the opposite of theatrical which is that they were, usually took place in one room, right. one set, characters, you know, um, Glass Menagerie, you know, likes that, or Arthur Miller plays, or Eugene O'Neill plays, God damn him to hell. Um, <laughs> I could go on about Eugene O'Neill. And so for me, it was a real, when I started writing plays, that's what I was writing, I was writing plays that took place in single rooms. It took me a long time to find out that you could do things like have music or have people break into song yeah. or have fights or anything like that. And so I'm asking, I guess, when did you, what was your influences as somebody who started writing plays at the age of 22? What, what had you experienced? Did you, have, did you go to the theater? No. I didn't, I didn't go to a lot of theater. I, got, I went to whatever theater was at my college campus. Right. So I didn't, I, I grew up in Arkansas, I went to Louisiana Tech and then Ohio University. It wasn't like I was in meccas of art. Uh, but like, uh, well, I, I grew up on a lot of film, like a lot, a lot of black exploitation, a lot of yeah. food flicks, uh, a lot of, you know, whatever. Like I, I read comic books. But like specifically what I was drawn to by the medium theater was when I did take a film course or when I did like make a short film in college, I realized that no matter how, whenever I was ambitious with those films, they looked like crap because they were all built on, because if you wanted a special effect, you need money. Right. And if you don't have money, it looks terrible. Right. Like you can't make a low budget like, Star Trek. Right. It, it just looks terrible, right? Right. Uh, and you know, but just, in, the, you're wearing helmets covered with aluminum yeah, foil. Just, yeah, it's just like colanders on heads yeah. the whole time, right? But, but in theater... You I, can have a colander on somebody's have, head. And it's, it's actually quite incredible in his imagination. I could make a, a so whole spaceship story, which is you, me, and this chair, these right. chairs, and, it, and the audience, because, you know, like I always think that film and television is, is trapped by budget. Right. Whereas, and the budget is what makes it good because it's always trapped in realism. Whereas in theater, to me, it's, it, the, the budget is imagination. Right. It's, it's that communication with the audience, and that's infinite. Right. So I, I can make worlds with no money. And so that's what attracted me to theater, the yeah. fact that I can make really big stories with no money. Whereas when I started go, do, when I was writing my first screenplays, it was... I was stuck, oh, we're going to be in a cafe. Can we go for that cafe? Can we borrow that someone's living room? Okay, so I can write a living yeah, room yeah. scene. And so you're always stuck writing what you could afford. Whereas in theater, I, I could put a dragon on stage that could kill children, and then they would suddenly become warriors and then kill the dragon back, and it worked. And then you would do it, and not only was it fun, but the audiences, you watch people's faces just like melt. Right. Like, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. Like watching my little son watch The Lion King, that first opening number, which is just puppets, yeah. you know? It, uh, it made me cry, it literally. Like, I didn't watch that at all. I watched yeah. him because it was just like, I knew that it was tickling something that movies didn't. It right. was like, so I, I do that medium too, but this is, that, that's what I love about the well, theater. Once you got to New York and you started seeing plays, or did you see the work of anybody who like, inspired you? Like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Uh, Stephen Ali Gerges, I loved his stuff. He yeah. was like Judas Iscariot, which was telling like the Jesus Judas story, but it was all modern. Yeah. So it was kind of like very much like Hamilton. It was it was super modern, but it was it was the Bible story, but right. told as if it was happening today. And I was like, wow! And it was large and big. It had like uh, twenty people in the cast. And I was super inspired by that. Top Dog, Underdog, uh, yeah. which was the opposite. It was just two people in the thing, but the language was so cool. Uh, and, and I was like, wow! I, you know, so there was there was definitely a uh, big influence. David Henry Wong was a big, big influence, uh, just because he was the Asian guy that's like, oh, Asian people can do this, yeah. and I can do it too. Uh, and without a doubt, with, that, with him opening the doors of the stories he told, it allows me to write the stories I get to tell, yeah. you know? So. Let me ask you, we have a few more minutes before I'm going to open it up to your questions, but I wanted to ask you about fights, because you and I have an enthusiasm, which is I love fights uh, in, in, in my personal life. Um, <laughs> No, actually, I don't. What I love is I love fights on stage. Yeah. I love combat because I'm, a, I'm something of a dork like you. It just never <laughs> occurred to me that I could like do that in the theater. Um, there's a big fight in Vietnam. Yeah. Why did you include a fight? 
uh, because there wasn't one yet. <laughs> that kind of like that's I, I I like my May both my director May and my the other director I work all the time Robert Ross Parker, like always laugh because I do think of theater the same way as I would say a studio thinks of like a big budget Hollywood movie. Right. I think of plays in set pieces. I go oh we've gone 15 minutes nothing crazies happen so hip hop song oh nothing's happened <laughs> movement dance sequence right. nothing's happened kung fu fight nothing's happened you know so it and it's it's mainly to keep it it, it just tickles me because it's the thing that because I know I'm going to have to watch this like a million times yeah. to get in front of an audience I'm like I need stuff that makes me want to watch it all the time because like the actors talking to each other after a while I'm like this is really the director's job. I'm just really just listening. Yeah, they're saying my words. Have great. you have you found any resistance to that? Like, oh yeah, we have to do a big kung fu fight right in the middle of the play, and people are like, yeah, we're not going to do a kung fu fight because we don't do that. Uh, no. <laughs> no, no. I mean, like that's the one good thing about you know being the writer of the thing is the fact that they, luckily, people want me. Like when they get me to write a play, they want my play, and so that they know that my style is part of that, and part of my style is. Just random car kung fu fights, hip hop songs, and and you know swear words. Can 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 you tell me? Because I don't, I'm not lucky enough to know your prior work. What's like the coolest thing you ever like said we're gonna do and you did it? Uh, it was it was the five headed dragon that was it was like the, the line was a stage sized dragon attacks this one girl. Yeah. And like and basically the set which was all hidden was actually parts of the dragon and it all just like came out at one time. Right. And she had to fight this giant dragon. Uh, and that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. No, I, I'll say that uh, I reached a point in my life, it was after I got into radio and stopped writing plays myself, where I, if I walked into a theater and saw, you know, curtain up or maybe the set's waiting for you and it's just like a living room, it was everything I could do to flee. I did not want to <laughs> see. This is my favorite story about the theater. Many, many years ago, I got an iguana. And uh, I didn't know anything about iguanas, so we got a book about iguanas. And the book was written by this man who loved iguanas more than you love anything. <laughs> he loved iguanas. And at the back of the book, there was a little iguana bibliography after you've learned everything. So you can go see things or read things about iguanas. And one of them was an entry for the play, The Night of the Iguana. <laughs> and this is what this iguana-obsessed author, expert, thought of the play, The Night of the Iguana. Not about iguanas at all. <laughs> but just a play about people with problems. <laughs> and all I could think of this guy, front row center, got there early. <laughs> <laughs> wearing his iguana tie, you know, <laughs> watching the play and being like, where's the fucking iguana? <laughs> and the, reason, the reason I mention this is I got to the point where I would like see all these plays and be like, oh my God, it's just people with problems. <laughs> and I would start sitting there thinking, where's the goddamn iguana? One day, some years ago, I went to see a... a play in Chicago where they had, uh, in the course of one play, like eight rock and roll musical numbers, a cattle stampede, and four gunfights. And I was like, these are my people. And I've been, <laughs> finally. So, I mean, I feel the same way. It's like, yes, God damn it, the theater, I mean, for some reason, and this is why I hate O'Neill. I'm sorry, I just, I realize I'm, it's, a, it's become a rant. I'm sorry. <laughs> the reason I hate O'Neill is because O'Neill, Back in the 20s, the theater was amazing. Elmer Rice was writing plays. They were doing all these yeah. crazy great things. And then O'Neill came along and said, no, the real, really the only dramatic act worth presenting as art is the act of confession, which will happen at the end of a very, 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 very long conversation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> fine, you're a virgin. Just say it and get off stage. <laughs> And so I, this is end of rant, I am very grateful for writers like Kui who, had, who didn't know that's all you were supposed to be able to do on stage. Yeah. 
and and I, and I don't know if you knew that you were breaking this rule. That nothing I, interesting. I had no idea. That nothing yeah, interesting no. is supposed to. Happen. I mean, without a doubt, ignorance is a huge benefit to yeah. making the kind of theater I make. <laughs> so. I mean, it, to me, it's amazing that because in my generation, we were all wondered about the future of the theater because our audience was aging and young people weren't going to it, and we never knew what we'd have to do to the theater to make young people like it. It never occurred to us that young people would like the theater because in the theater they could do whatever they wanted, yeah. which ended up saving the theater. So thank you for saving the theater. And we, we, wanted, we wanted to leave the last 15 minutes or so for your questions, because many of you have seen the play, so perhaps you have more smart questions for Quee than I did. So by all means. Uh, do we have microphones? Russell, here, we have a microphone. Is it on? Yeah, okay. Uh, are, are you going to, either or both of you going to have an opportunity to see this play here? Uh, sadly, it's not being done during the two days I'm here, so I'll have to, but fortunately, fortunately for me, and I think the world at large, this production is moving on to Seattle, mm -hmm. another production in New York, so I have a feeling it will be coming to where I am pretty soon. Yeah. And I, are you going to get to see it? Uh, not, not this weekend. Because uh, I leave tomorrow morning. Yeah. I came in last night. Bad skin. I'm here for you. Just yeah. you. <laughs> so. Somebody right there. Yeah, apparently we're being live streamed, so we oh, need to be okay. on. Yeah, yeah. I thought the music was brilliant. I want to hear a little bit about how you picked all the right songs for just the right segues. Oh, <laughs> well, it, it, the, the music was, I mean, without it, it's, it's, it's more my sound designer, Shane Reddig, and May uh, than myself in that. But I, I do remember having very, one very strong opinion, which was I didn't want any war rock in it. Because, uh, like, uh, when well, we define that. What is like, war like, rock? You know, like, uh, uh, like, you know, the, the kind of rock and roll, like, uh, Credence Clear, CCR. So like, yeah. yeah, yeah like, 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 the sort of thing that you would put in, like, the Apocalypse Now. Yeah, Apocalypse like Jim Morrison Now. Yeah, or something Jim Morrison. Like that. Like, stuff like that. Because I was like, oh, that's kind of the war movie. Like, when you think of the Vietnam War movies, that's the, that's the soundtrack we all hear, hear right? And I was like, well, you know, during that time era, there was a whole bunch of other music that had nothing to do with that. I, and it's very important to me that I needed to define, you know, like how we were going to experience this world. Uh, and so, and, and I, I myself grew up, like that was the music my parents listened to. And so that's what I wanted to put up there. And so that, that, that it, there was no real deep choice. I just like, I don't want to hear putting war rock in this play. Also because I didn't want the play to, yes, it was about the aftermath about war, but it wasn't about war itself. So I was like, oh, let's just, it's a love story. Let's put a whole bunch of like, you know, uh, good music that we all would like to have sex to. So. <laughs> yeah, we're picking somebody right there. Precisely the love story. Uh, I was caught in not just uh, the beauty of, of, an, of the experience of learning, which we do from anything that comes from somewhere else, but the uh, whole idea that Shakespeare and all, everybody has used cast in, off on the foreign land as the beginning of a new life. Yeah. And is, they've isn't left that how people behind that how in, those, starts? in those other places. They've left families behind as well. Yeah. So this was very much how love stories happen. Yeah. And that's, I just thought that was fantastically great. Oh, thank you. There's a question right there, I think. As Peter uh, mentioned, you explore the libidos of your parents quite extensively in this play, but you actually go further and explore the libido of your grandmother in this play, <laughs> which in my experience is unprecedented. <laughs> yeah. The relationship, though, between, between your mother and her mother is, is one, I, I think, of the most... Uh, engaging aspects of this play, and I wonder if you talk about how you developed that and what you were trying to show us. Uh, well, that, that's the relationship I probably know the best out of all of them, because that was, like my grandmother and my mom had, like throughout my, like she, my grandmother lived with me till, the, till she passed away, and it was, uh, that, that relationship, was, you know, I always laughed at them because I was always, I always thought of them as the Sanford and son, uh, the Asian Sanford and son of, uh, you know, of our neighborhood. Uh, because, like, my mom was very much like Lamont, and she was very much like Red Fox, very, you know, she's like, I'm going to die any minute, and she never did. She's never sick. 
um, she always threatened to die, like right then and there. You know, um, and my mom was uh, tried to, you know, appeal to her, uh, and, and and a lot of it had to do with like, oh, I didn't marry a terrible person. She's like, he's a terrible person, um, but yeah, but but addressing her libido, it, my grandmother actually never hit on my dad. I was about that, to mention that. That, yeah. that was that was actually I had another character. My mom had a friend on, in the the camp, and they only had one scene. And, and in which, because she, she was the one who was first attracted to my dad. And then my mom uh, was like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but, uh, but it was weird to suddenly just have one character that only existed for one scene. So I was like, I'll just take that and shove it into my grandmother's character. <laughs> and then just have that be there because it doesn't make sense. And also I only had two actresses, so I didn't have another actress to show up. So it, it was out of necessity that that happened. And then it became really funny, so I just was like, have at it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Hey, um, I, I have one more question, uh, which is, you said you wrote this first play when you were 22 about, you know, the experience of Vietnamese ex Americans or Vietnamese yeah. people, and now you've written this other play. How much of an obligation do you feel as, like, well-known, successful Vietnamese American writer to speak for the Vietnamese American experience? Wow. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely an onus that I, I, I start to realize is on me more and more now. Mm. Like when I started, I was totally like the, the kind of rock and roll kid who's like, no, nah, that's not my that's not my thing. I'm just gonna write what I want. And then as more and more people started to write to me very angrily that I wasn't taking up that responsibility, I started to realize that it was and usually it wasn't really the angry audience members that would write to me because I did get those that they're like, oh, you're not speaking, you know, about us more. You you've written a lot of things about. You know, I see someone there with some plays of mine that deal with dragons and zombies. But you don't write, you know, but you're one of the few, you know, Vietnamese American writer, writers out there and you never write about Vietnamese. And so to finally start doing this, like, it, it, I'm starting to realize the impact that I have in that community. Um, specifically, I got an email, uh, like, during the first month of this run. And it was from this, this young Asian kid. I don't even know if he was Vietnamese. And the, the, the end in the email just said, uh, you know, as an Asian American kid, the world teaches me or tells me I need to be weak. But this play made me feel strong. Hey. And so that was like, okay, I, I realize I have a responsibility. So it, it's, it's one that I've, I'm, I'm starting to, to take more seriously. Yeah. Without a doubt. And is that something you're going to be pursuing and like you have a Hollywood career going on now, you're writing for mm -hmm. TV. Is this something you're going to be doing? Yeah, well, without a doubt, I would, I would, I definitely would like to ha see, I would, I would go more positive Asian American representation. But right now, any Asian American representation yeah. out there, uh, that you know, so so that's definitely, uh, you know, when it comes to Hollywood and, and TV, that's something that I'm definitely pursuing. But I'm gonna still be writing these plays too. Like sure. this is play one of five, uh, so. Uh, we have some more questions. I think in the last one, because the one thing I've learned about OSF is everything starts on time, everything ends on time. <laughs> which is unusual in the American theater. So we have about six minutes. I love the rap music and uh, the songs and just, I mean, it was so moving. And the other piece of the play that really was amazing to me was how we could be laughing hysterically, but then you put the mic up a little closer? My, oh, but then I'd have tears in my eyes, you know, the next second and just, you just did a beautiful balance there of helping us hear what you wanted to say no. through, the, through both ways. So anyway, oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we have a microphone there, and then we'll, and we'll come to you. So I understand that there's more to the story. There is. And I'm wondering where you are with that story, and when might we expect to hear more, especially about your father's first wife or relatives? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that, that was, that's what the plays are about. Like, because uh, there's, there's things in this play that, uh, that I only answer the who do they get together in play one, uh, but like play two, three, four, and five. Totally really, different. five plays. Five plays. About I didn't mean for it to be five plays. It's funny how I, that happens. Yeah, I, I meant to write a two-part play because like yeah. I'll make it. I'll just answer it real quick, and then as I kept during, I realized I had too much story for yeah. each play, and so I just kept on going. Okay, well, I've outlined five plays, so I've, I'm at an outline stage. They've been outlined. Uh, play two is basically about my parents' actual marriage. Because all you get in play one is them getting together. Play two is their marriage, dealing with my dad's first wife. Uh, what happened to my, you know, like, you know, well, I actually don't answer the brother question yet in that play two. But it's really about that marriage. And 
it's going to be a while before the play comes out, so I'll just tell you what it's about. So play two <laughs> is basically like at some point, like uh, my they get married. Uh, the first wife finds out that you know my dad's alive, and they get they re, you know get in contact again, which immediately annuls their marriage. My mom's and dad's marriage. That really happened. That really. Yeah, happened. For those who haven't seen the play, one thing you find out early is that the character of of Kui's father had a wife and kids in Vietnam who he lost in the exodus out of Vietnam. Yeah, and so it's really them dealing with that and how my parents' relationship survives and manages through through that period. It's very, very rocky. Play three deals with uh, my my mom's brother uh, in the play that you get a little bit, in, you know, the question, does he make it to America or not? And uh, he doesn't. Uh, like, and that was with a very, Spoiler alert. The, the first play that I ever wrote was actually about that. That yeah. was done poorly. And so this is my second attempt to finally write that play. And that, and it's, it's basically like him, his wife, has two kids in 1988 boarded a, a Vietnamese fishing boat and tried to make it to America, but the, the engine of the boat died in the middle of the China Sea. And so uh, they all lost their lives, except for the youngest son, which is my, who we adopted as my brother. And it was my mom's kind of struggle and fight to get him to America. It was the, 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 wow. story, the story of play three. Play four is actually brings you all the way back to like 1940s, 50s Vietnam, because it deals with my grandmother's suicide um, in 1999. And in that play, we'll, we'll, we'll go back and explore a Vietnam that existed before the war because we never talk about that Vietnam right and so you get to see that Vietnam her experiences of being uh, a, uh, a, a, a whatever a, 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 not a sign bride I'm not I can't think of the word but like uh, about her life and her two marriages and then the last play is about my parents to that today to this moment uh, they're, they're dealing with retirement for the first time and 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 this and also there's this kind of motif like at the very first in the very last scene or second to last scene you hear about them going to a diner well my mom actually ends up working in that diner and owning that diner and that's the diner we grew up in and then and and just this past year uh, it, it's the reason why I had like they were able to afford college or everything for me and my mom had independence right um, you know, it, it ends with a girl crashing a car through my mom's diner, and that's the end of my mom's diner. That actually happened this year. And so I was like, well, I know how this play ends, because it all wraps around this one diner that, that, that is actually the crux of my parents' marriage, because there was a lot of, like in play two, you'll see, there, there's a lot of fighting between my mom and my dad. When the, the marriage gets rocky, my mom wants to buy this diner because the people are leaving, and my dad very like very unsure of himself was like no i'm a vietnamese man you're a vietnamese woman you have to listen to me we've saved all this money to buy a house not a diner and if you want to go through that you know we're not going to do that and my mom's response is then you can get the hell out and kick my dad out and my dad disappeared for a week and i was a little kid i was like five or six at the time just bawling my eyes out. i was like what happened to dad where's he where he's going he hasn't come back and then after five or six days and he told me about what happened there he finally comes back home with the deeds to the to the to the, to the diner puts them down and it's like i'd rather be your husband than a, a vietnamese man and from this point forward you are that head of this household that's it and so it's the story from that point forward of how my mom becomes the matriarch of our family and so it is so that is uncommon when it comes to, like my mom is the most powerful voice in my family and so that is kind of what this five play journey is it's it's about their marriage and how they you know how marriages go this way and this way it's not a love story of like it's all perfect like it's each time it was about how my dad and my mom had to actually make each other fall in love with each other again to save them save themselves from the the the, the broken marriage from the death of her brother the death of my grandmother and then the destruction of this diner and it's really about how love saves them each and every time over five decades wow uh that was pretty amazing and it's pretty exciting and uh, we kind of have to leave it there. So thank you all very much for coming and thank you. thanks for coming to Thank you. <laughs> Hold on. Thanks, man.